Hi, this is Chet Rehal, Chair of the Division of Cardiology at Mayo Clinic Rochester. Today I have a very special guest, Dr. Ray Gibbons. Dr. Gibbons is undoubtedly well known to all of you who are watching. Dr. Gibbons has been a national leader in the, area, in the areas of ischemic heart disease and cardiac imaging and has served as the president of the American Heart Association in the years 2006 to 2007. Ray, welcome. Thanks, Chad. Ray, I want to ask you about healthcare reform. At times it feels like cardiology is being picked on, as it were. Are we being picked on, or is there more to this than meets the eye? Well, in some sense we are, yeah. but we're being picked on with reason, and that is because we have much of the disease. If you look at the Medicare data, about 35% of Medicare fee-for-service patients have ischemic heart disease, another 18% have heart failure, and 9% have atrial fibrillation. By comparison, breast cancer and prostate cancer are down in the 2 to 3% range. So we've got a lot of the disease and a lot of the therapy, so we are being picked on, but it's because we're a major player. So Ray, you're telling me that almost half of all Medicare patients would have some chronic cardiovascular condition? Well, that's correct. Now, it's a little hard to sort out because as clinicians know, there are patients who have multiple conditions at once. So it's hard to sort out on a per patient basis. But those are the data. Uh, the other data that are fascinating are that costs are really concentrated in a small percentage of all the patients. So for U.S. healthcare, 5% of the population account for 50% of the cost. That's astounding. And 10% account for two-thirds of the cost. So a lot of those patients are cardiac patients, and that's the reason why there's so much attention on cardiovascular disease. So Ray, what are the opportunities for us as a profession to, get, to come to grips with this? Well, I think we need to focus on delivering high-valued care, uh, care that we know improves patient outcomes, satisfaction, and service at a reasonable cost over a span of time. And there are multiple opportunities ranging, the whole, ranging across the whole spectrum of cardiovascular disease. In the field of prevention, we have the National Million Hearts Initiative trying to deliver yeah. in clinical patients the ABCs, aspirin, blood pressure, cholesterol, and smoking cessation more reliably than we've done. In your area, PCI, we clearly have a need for better medical therapy before PCI and certainly better medical therapy after PCI because the COURAGE trial showed us that optimal medical therapy is important for everybody. Um, and the selection of patients for PCI, I think, is an important issue for clinicians because there is such a spectrum across the country of the rates of PCI in Medicare patients. And there are regions that do far more PCI than the rest of the country. And I think we all have to be concerned about that and pay attention to that. Ray, do you think the appropriateness criteria will help with this, or um, are they a stopgap measure? I think they're a step in the right direction, but I, as I have said in writing in various publications, they have limitations, and clinicians who look at them quickly realize this doesn't quite fit the flow of clinical practice. That's one of the dilemmas in designing a system that's really meant to be software-based. Um, and follow a uh, sort of decision tree for mm -hmm. computer software. But I think uh, they're an important step in the right direction, and I think the ACC has done the right thing in pointing out that they can identify areas of overutilization. Ray, you've mentioned some of the opportunities on a national scale, but what about at, at more of a micro level? What should individual practitioners and healthcare institutions be doing to position themselves properly in this era of healthcare reform? I think they should think about the value equation as they're uh, Explain that to going us. through. Well, Mayo Healthcare Policy put out a specific definition, quality, service, and patient satisfaction in the numerator and cost over a span of time in the denominator. So we should think about what we are doing, whether it improves outcomes and whether we know it does, and whether it's really at an acceptable cost. I think that's how we position ourselves. We should be thinking more from an overall societal perspective um, in applying decisions to individual patients. I think we should also try to develop the evidence uh, where we don't have it as to whether things really work as well as we 
think. So as you know, we're a leader in the Cabana trial uh, looking at ablation and atrial fibrillation. I think it's a great example of the need for more evidence. We're also participating in the PROMISE trial looking at CT angiography um, to see whether it really is the cat's meow from a diagnostic standpoint. That's fantastic, Ray. R Ray, in the era of, of healthcare reform, one of the consequences has been the integration of cardiovascular practices with hospitals. Traditionally, they had been two separate entities. Now, with the cardiologists either working for or, or merged with hospitals, how are we going to align the metrics between the patient, the practitioner, and the hospital so that everyone's working towards the goals that you mentioned? Well, I think in some cases it's a natural. So, for example, uh, for the issue of readmissions, um, particularly after myocardial infarction or after heart failure, we need better coordinated care systems. Uh, we should all recognize, and I think we all do recognize, unfortunate consequences to our patients when they leave the hospital and the ball gets dropped in the next week or two or three. Um, and these integrated systems should help facilitate that. Here at Mayo, with our regional uh, practices, uh, we certainly, I think, do a better job at those handoffs than we did five or ten years ago. But there's always room for improvement, and we all has, have to keep moving in that direction. I think for other areas, it's a little hard to know how the integrated systems and accountable care organizations will play out, because there will be an inevitable tension between practitioners and hospitals. Will EMRs help, Ray? Will EMRs be able to talk to each other so people don't have to redo the imaging studies when patients are referred to a tertiary care center? Well, that's obviously the ultimate goal. And healthcare policy wonks in Washington would like to believe that they're going to solve the whole problem. I think you and I know working at a center with a good EMR, it certainly helps but it doesn't solve everything. Um, and in time, as these records become more compatible with one another, I think we will do better from the standpoint of sharing information and, for example, sharing image data. But at the moment, I think we have a long way to go. Uh, we're fortunate to have integration of both our outpatient and inpatient records. There are a whole yeah. bunch of centers that don't have that luxury. Yeah. My guest today has been Dr. Ray Gibbons. Dr. Gibbons has given us a fascinating high-level overview of healthcare reform and the challenges that it portends for the practice of cardiovascular diseases in the United States. He's spoken about societal, institutional, and individual challenges that we will all face. Ray, I thank you very much for a fascinating discussion. Thanks for having me, Jack.